Yo, what's good, Knicks Nation? Welcome back to another Game of the Week preview. Of course, we have to preview this game. The New York Knicks facing the San Antonio Spurs tomorrow, Friday at 8 p.m. at, at, they're, they're, they're away this time. They're away. They're at the Frost Bank Center where the San Antonio Spurs play. So that's where the Knicks will be playing them. And of course, who better to join me to break down this game is none other than my guy, Noah Magaro George. He is the founder of the Vic and Roll. Make sure to hit that thumbs up button for your boys. Make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And make sure to support our sponsor, Underdog Fantasy. Use that promo code KFTV to get up to a $100 match. Okay, let's get into this. This is a good one, man. Look. It's not often I get to cover uh, West Coast teams. Sometimes, like, depending on the, the situation, Noah, like, you know, we've done the Sixers a couple of times. We've done the Raptors a few times because we did a trade with them. You know, it's always fun to talk about talk about other teams, especially a team with a potential rookie of the year. But before we get into all of that, how are you doing, man? How you been feeling? Great. I mean, I'd be lying if I said it hasn't been a long season for people who are covering the Spurs or people who are fans of the Spurs, but... They've got Wimbenyama on the roster. He's a generational prospect. They're going to figure out how to build around him. So I can't complain too much. And if we look at it from that way, hey, I'm doing great. Uh, yeah, man. I mean, you're doing great. I mean, the last time you spoke, you were just engaged. You're now married. So congratulations on that. I am. Yeah, that. thank yeah. you. Thank you yeah, very much. Yeah, man, absolutely. Congratulations on that. You know, I see the plaques behind you, but you're getting even <laughs> starting to expand. You got some different colors over there. You got some different players. I like it, man. I like I like that setup and how it's just expanding. But, yo, no, let me ask you this question first before we get in, because this is a Knicks channel and everybody wants to know, what has your thoughts been about the New York Knicks this season thus far? They've been an interesting team. I really like how they weren't afraid to make moves that could potentially backfire, but also allowed other people to expand their games, have more opportunities, you know, moving off of someone like Emmanuel Quickly, who I'm a huge fan of, but it opened up minutes for other guys. They were able to add other assets. Obviously, RJ Barrett was gone in that, but we've seen recently what Deuce McBride can do, right? He's been really good. Jalen Brunson's sure. been a lot of fun. I believe Julius Randle's out right now, but... This has been a team that, at least from the outside looking in here, they've been really resilient. They've really weathered the storm of a handful of injuries. So I'm excited to see them. From my understanding, it's going to be a mostly healthy team minus Julius Randle, but I think it's going to be another really good test with Wimbenyama against Mitchell Robinson because he really held him in check that first time. And I think Wimby, he's 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 got his eyes on that matchup. You know, he's a guy mm. who doesn't let things go. He remembers things. He wants to prove himself and... I'm excited to see if he can kind of get a leg up on Mitchell Robinson or if Mitchell Robinson's going to get him again. It will be interesting, man. And I think the one thing you talked about this team is resilient, and that's for sure what this team has been. With all the injuries that they've gone through, whether it's Julius Randle, Mitchell Robinson, OG Ananobi, all those guys being out, even Jalen Brunson dealing with a minor injury, and you even get against that Cavs game, Deuce McBride playing 47 minutes, as you mentioned, just like his rise in this roster, Precious Achua, Isaiah Hartenstein looking like a, a true starter in this league. So there's just been – it's like the Knicks are hitting gold in some aspects by the way that – they're able to find guys, and it just shows you how deep this roster is, right? And, you know, outside of the Pistons trade right now, we're still waiting for those guys to, <laughs> to start doing the job, Burks and Bogey. I won't go too far into that, but, you know, for the most part, this team has been rolling. They What, they're on a three-game winning streak right now, maybe even four. Let's see. They got they beat the Spurs. You talk about they beating the Raptors. Who else did they beat? They I think they may. Let me see. Let me see. Let me, go, let me go check this real quick <laughs> and see where the Knicks are right now. Because I'm going back and forth between three, four game winning streak. They're on a three game winning streak right now. Nets, Pistons, Raptors. Uh, I might be getting a little ahead of myself because I'm looking at the Spurs <laughs> and I know how we're going to get into that matchup. But, you know, Knicks are on a three game winning streak. They're showing how much depth they have on this team. It's good. Um, you know, you talk about the Mitchell Robinson and the, the Wemby matchup. We'll get into that a little bit later. But I'm interested because he just returned coming back from ankle surgery. He played his first game yesterday against the Toronto Raptors and was just bullying people. Obviously, the conditioning still needs to get up just from being out since December 8th, but he looked okay, man, for coming back off an injury. But going from the Knicks to the Spurs now, what, is your, what has been your take on the Spurs season? It's been a long season, but I think we were always – pretty privy to this notion that this was going to be the ultimate rebuilding year where they were going to experiment with things where they wanted to see what they had around Wimbenyama. You know, general manager Brian Wright told fans pretty much day one from the second that they drafted him, whether he was on TV, whether it was the press conferences directly after drafting Wimbenyama, 
uh, you know, this is going to be a slow burn, right? Like we're not going to add a bunch of pieces. We're not going to be reckless. We're not going to be trading our picks for assets to win right now. We want to figure out one, what do we have in these young guys? And two, if we have anything in these young guys, who's going to stick around? So he's been saying that Popovich has been saying that I know that it's a 17 win season. It's been a long season. But they've done everything that they said they were going to do. They've given a lot of guys opportunities. They've shifted pieces around, whether that's Keldon moving to the bench, whether that's Zach Collins moving to the bench, whether that's Sohan as a point guard, whether that's Trey Jones becoming a starter, Julian Champagne becoming a starter, moving Wimbenyama from power forward to center. They've done a lot of different things to experiment. They want to learn what they have. And I think they have learned a lot about this team this season. And from that point of view, I think you can't look at this season as anything but a success. You know, I know the 17 wins are hard, but I still think it's very much a success if we're going to look at it from they set goals, they've reached those goals. Okay. And I got to like, so the goal is just to see who's going to stick. So who, in your in your opinion, who is sticking is outside of Vassell and Wembenyama and, and Sohan, who else is sticking on this roster? Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at some of the other pieces on this roster, I really like Blake Wesley. He's shown himself as a guy who, if he can sort of round out his game, he is an excellent point of attack defender. He's a guy who is electric with the ball in his hands. He can break down a defense a little bit with a straight line speed. I think he's someone who, again, he's got some things to add to his game before. He's a real every night rotational player who's making an impact, but he's sticking for me. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of other guys that are probably going to stick. Like I like Julian Champagne. I think he can be a role player off the bench, someone who plays some defense, someone who shoots the three ball, but he just doesn't really bring a lot else to the table. And mm. I think if we're looking at anyone else on this roster, it's got to be Trey Jones. Like Trey Jones, he may not be the mm. starting point guard of the future. He may not be that guy who's running your offense full time in a year, two years, three years. But to me, he's one of those Spurs for life guys who he can be coming off the bench for you for a really long time. Super steady hand, playmaking, great at driving to the rim, finishing at the rim, plays some great point of attack defense as well. Um, you know, doesn't make a lot of mistakes, a really smart player. And he's built a lot of synergy with Wimbenyama. So if they're not able to find that starting point guard, let's say through the draft this summer or, or free agency this summer, he's a guy who can just sort of be a placeholder. So I like Trey Jones. I like Blake Wesley. I like Julian Champagne. I like Sohan. I like Vassell. Obviously, we love Wimbenyama, and I think for now, those are probably the only guys who are going to stick. I might throw Keldon into that conversation, but he's been an iffy fit. You mm. could see them maybe capitalizing on moving him. Same thing with Zach Collins, but those guys who we talked about just a second ago, I think they have a chance to stick long term. And what about Malachi Branham? Because he was he was touted as like a solid draft pick when he was coming out of college. Yeah, he's just been so inconsistent, not just as a scorer, as a shooter, but really as a defender, like Greg Popovich multiple times a season has put him in the rotation, then pulled him out of the rotation, then benched him for a long time to kind of get him on the same page. Like if you're not playing defense, if you're not doing the little things, then you're not just going to get minutes because you're a young guy and we invested a first round pick in you. Like you have mm -hmm. to earn it. And he's had games or and even stretches where it's like three, four, five games where he's averaging 18 points or 17 points and he's playing at least serviceable defense. And then he'll just sort of fall into a funk where he's, doing nothing for, you know, five, six, the same amount of games. So it's really hard to trust him. He's very young. Maybe he does stick. Maybe he figures something out this summer. But I just, it's hard for me to see it as a guy who was touted as someone who can kind of get his shot off the dribble a little bit, a spot-up specialist. Like, he's just not hitting those spot-up shots. He's not been great off the dribble. He's not been efficient on cuts. He's not been a great playmaker, even a secondary playmaker. His defense has been, if you look at different metrics, near the bottom of the league, literally one of the 10 worst players as far as defense goes and a lot of different metrics. So it's tough to trust him as a guy who will be here long-term. And that pains me to say it because I was a big Malachi guy coming out of the draft. Salute to Knicks Nation. Thank you all again for tuning in for another Game of the Week preview with me on the other side is my guy, Noah Margar Margaro George. He is the founder of the Vic and Roll. You can go subscribe to that newsletter through Substack and make sure you hit that thumbs up button for your boys. Make sure to subscribe to the channel. Make sure to support our sponsor, Underdog Fantasy. Use that promo code KFTV. Uh, Noah, so you talk about rookies, you know, even though you're drafted number one overall <laughs> in the Spurs program, you're not going to get burned, right? But there is a guy that's getting burned because number one overall pick, it is Victor Wimbenyama, and he's been proving it. So what has been your thoughts on Victor this season? Yeah, I mean, he has just been a revelation for the Spurs. Because if you look at what they have right now and how this season has gone, I don't even know what you would do if you were a Spurs fan if they had landed 
say Brandon Miller or Scoot mm. Henderson instead. Like he has been a guy who has been box office. He has sold tickets for this organization. He has sold merchandise for the organization. He's brought hope for a better tomorrow. This is probably the most hopeful this fan base has been since Kawhi Leonard. And like the way Kawhi exited was really mm. tough for Spurs fans. I think they were really pessimistic for a long time. It kind of put them in limbo for a while, but having Wimbenyama, it gives them a direction and being able to watch a guy who, and I, I don't mean this as like, to, to sound like a hater in any way, but he's a guy who doesn't have any real go-to moves right now, commits a ton of turnovers, um, a lot of mental mistakes on the defensive end, yet he's one of the best defensive players just based on his tools, based on his instincts. He's able to score because of his length, his fluidity. He's able to shoot. It's like, if this is as good as he is right now, and this is as bad as he is ever going to be in his career, I don't I don't even want to be another fan base of another team thinking, what can this guy be in two, three years? Like to me, if he's this good and he doesn't have a lot of the other things we've talked about, man, it's gonna be scary for other fan bases. So for me, when I'm watching Wimben Yama this year, it's just been wow. Like they, they let him do what he wants for the most part. They let him experiment. And it's been a lot of fun. We've got those one-legged, you know, step back threes. We've got the behind the back passes. We've got him running some pick and rolls as like you know, inverted pick and rolls where he's the guard and he's hitting the guard as the role man. So it's been fantastic. I've enjoyed watching Wimbenyama, but as someone who sees Wimbenyama all the time, I'm kind of interested. Well, uh, what have you seen from him? Because I know it's easy for me to probably get carried away talking about, you know, this and that, and he may seem overrated, but you know, what is, what does it look like to you when you see him playing? How much of him have you got to see play? I've got like, I tap into the Spurs just because, you know, what was it? I mean, during summer league, I mean, he had that rough start, right? You're like, Ooh, is this, <laughs> yeah. is this really the guy? I mean, I was out there at summer league. I'm like, Oh, I wasn't, I wasn't in the building, but I was catching on TV. I'm like, wow, this is, you know, that's pretty tough. But then he bounces back at summer league and then just tuning in for this season and just watching his development. Like I don't check in every single day. You're like, oh, you're like, you're covering the team. I cover the Knicks. So it's like, I don't have yeah, that much it. time yeah. to watch all 82 games of the San Antonio Spurs. But when I see a good matchup, especially when it's against the Phoenix Suns, when he's going against OKC, I like watching those matchups because I think those in those instances, when he's going against Katie, when he's going against Chet, I'm like, okay, Let's see how he gets up for like the big moment. And for the most part, he does. And for what you're talking about, making mistakes, you know, still a, a raw product for the NBA to a certain degree, right? It's just fascinating how he's able to just elevate his game and still be an impactful player. I mean, when you're talking about defeating the, the, the Suns early on in the season, the matter <laughs> that he did, I mean, that's just so impressive for a rookie and I'm pretty sure they'd even have the sell for some, for those games, if I, if I'm correct. So the thing to think that this is what he can do at what, as what you're saying at this stage of the game, he's just going to be very impressive as he adds more to his game. But I think the thing about Wemby as I watch him is that just tantalizing is the word for him because the, his yeah, skill set, like whether it's just bringing the ball up, as you talk about initiating the offense, playing, being down at the five, uh, playing power forward. Like he just seems, like, yeah, there's a struggle, there's a learning curve, but he's always willing to accept the challenge. And it seems like he's able to meet like the, not necessarily the bare minimum, but get to like the middle ground of what he's supposed to be doing in those matchups. And so I'm impressed by that. He is, it's just, it's just weird, man, because for his height, you never see anything like that. And I'm <laughs> yeah. like, well, I'm like, if he, if between him, I, I, I think the thing that I'm really looking forward to is the battle that he has between him and Chet. OKC and if the, if the Spurs can just, you know, skyrocket to back, being back where yeah. they were with Tim Duncan, Manu and Parker and those guys, and you get like a serious battle between the Spurs and OKC, that's going to be fun for years to come between and Chet too, and Wimby. Oh my God. Happens, the playoffs, oh my God. Yeah, wow, it's going to be exciting. That would be a dream but, come true. Absolutely. But, you know, for Wimby right now, man, just an impressive talent. I don't, I don't, I wouldn't say that, because it's very hard for me to say like, oh, you know, he's like the the clear cut one like LeBron James. I think for LeBron, it was like you watched LeBron in high school, right? And you're like, that's that's clear cut. I think with Wemby, there's still that development process that has to go on to make sure that he's a full NBA product. With LeBron, it was just kind of like he's in the NBA and it's like, uh, he's NBA. He's like not saying Wemby isn't NBA ready, but it's like you could see LeBron was able to be that guy for a team moving forward. I think you can see that for Wemby, but there's still much more that he needs to add to his game, and the team just needs to shape shape up too. Yeah, I mean, like the context around the San Antonio Spurs needs to get better for Wembenyama. They're one of the worst shooting teams 
in the league. The spacing is really bad around him. But I think for me, and we can move on here in a second, but like the thing that has been most impressive for me with Wimbenyama, hands down, is most rookies, like even Chet right now, you see guys hitting a, a, a rookie wall, right? Wimbenyama sort of hit a rookie wall after he came back from having that minutes restriction, the ankle sprain back near Christmas. He's been better and better and better and better every single month since the new year. Like he has gotten better and better and better. He's scoring better. He's shooting better. His scoring has been more efficient. His blocks have gone up. His steals have gone up. His fouls have gone down. His turnovers have gone down. And so I'm just really impressed that he's been able to, even amid a 17 win season that can be so debilitating for a young team, he keeps his head up. He's motivated to go out there. He's getting better all the time. He's putting in the work. He's a leader on and off the court. Like those are the things that I want to see from a guy who's going to lead you to the promised land one day, maybe. I want to see that from him. And, and he's and he's shown that. So to me, I think he can be that guy who is the clear cut number one guy in the league for years to come. And I don't, you know, I don't want to be too biased, but just getting to watch him all the time, it certainly feels like he's that kind of LeBron, Kobe, Michael Jordan sort of prospect where as soon mm. as they hit their peak, nobody's going to be as good as they are. And it's going to be clear cut for a long time that he's the best player. I just don't see anyone else with his tools, his skill set. I just don't see it. I mean, the height really is what separates him at the like for what he can do in my in like in my opinion. Obviously, the like very talented player, but to do all that at his height is like what we see from KD, right? It's like a guy who could just score and shoot. It's like, whoa, that's that's tough. But I gotta ask you, man, because I know we're talking about the future right now, like what he can be in the league and be potentially a face of the league for years to come. But is he winning rookie of the year right now? Is he is he the clear oh, yeah. winner? Okay. Oh yeah, for me, yeah, I, I think. Maybe a month ago, you could have made an argument for Chet that uh, the, the Thunder are one of the best teams in the league. He's, you know, putting up what it was like 18, 10, something. You know, he, yeah, he's crazy stat line. But Wimbin Yama is now edging close to 21 points per game, over 10 rebounds per game, more than three and a half blocks per game, over 1.2 steals per game. He leads the leagues in total steals and blocks. He's the first player in NBA history to have 100 threes, 200 blocks, 100 steals like I know that that's not, you know, the numbers aren't necessarily everything. You definitely want to see some wins, but I, I just think if you switched places between you put Chet where Wemby is now and where Wemby where Chet is, the Thunder are like the clear-cut favorite for a title, and the Spurs are even worse than they are. And that's no shade towards Chet. He is fantastic. I think in any other year, most years, even last year, probably the last couple of years, he runs away with Rookie of the Year. He's an amazing player, and I don't want to get that twisted. I'm not throwing shade at him at all. Love him as a player. I think he is going to be an all-NBA guy for years to come, but I just think Wimbenyama is going to be an MVP guy for years to come. And I think he's been better as a rookie, just given the situation, given the context. Wimbenyama's done more with less. So you talk about Wemby being rookie of the year. I got to ask about the, the next guy. Is this going to be his future running mate for years to come? Devin Vassell, because, you know, He's very impressive at the wing position, man. So what are your thoughts on Vassell for this team? I love Vassell. He's a guy who I was really big on out of the NBA draft back in 2020. I had him fourth on my big board. Now, that's probably not accurate if we're going back in time. Halley's probably, you know, definitely passed him there. But he's a guy who I thought if he can be more than a three and D player, he can create off the dribble a little bit. He can knock down the threes. He can cut. He can play good defense. He can play make a little bit. Like that's a guy who I think is worthy of a top five pick. The Spurs got him with the 11th pick and he has developed into a player who I thought he might be able to be at his high end outcome. So I like him a lot next to Wimbenyama. He's built a lot of synergy with him as a pick and roll partner. He's a guy who at the end of close games, they can give the ball to, he can create a little bit, get to in spots in the mid range. And I think the thing for me was I thought, okay, we have a two level score, a guy who can, you know, make threes, a guy who can get to his spot in the mid range. But if he can become a three level scorer, that's a different player. That's a much, much more valuable player. And Devin has upped his attempts near the rim. He's finishing over 71% of his shots at the basket this season. That puts him in the same discussion as guys like Shea Gilgis Alexander, Luka Doncic. Now, those guys have a higher volume. They get to the line more often. But he has been incredibly effective. He's learned how to use change of pace. He's learned how to use different footwork, whether it's the Euro step, the Pinoy step, the slow step. He's got it all right now. So, I think there's still obviously room for him to grow as a player. Consistency is definitely something we want to see more from him. But uh, I think he's a guy who's here long term. I think he can be the running mate. Can he be number two? Can he be the Robin? 
I don't know. I, I think you probably got to get a little bit better out of your Robin, but can he be the third mm. fiddle? I think so. I think he could be your sort of Chris Middleton to your Giannis. If you have your, you know, your Dame and your Giannis in, in let's just throw out a superstar random name and in, in Wimby. Yeah, he can definitely be your Chris Middleton. And, and I think that's a fantastic player for him to aspire to be. Oh, for sure. Chris Middleton is an awesome player for, for any player to aspire to be. I mean, Middleton before all the injuries, that's a guy that can get to all the spots. I mean, had the herky jerky motion to his game, right? But you saw how crucial he was to the Bucks in winning that championship. So, Chris Middleton, I know he's gotten a lot of flack over the seasons, man, just for <laughs> for how he's for for his game. But solid player to for any young player to aspire to, especially when it comes to like getting to your spots in the mid range and knowing how to use footwork, go at your own pace. Like, I think that's a great idea for Devin Vassell if he was to model a game. So then, what you're telling me then? is that you need a guard, another point guard, someone to initiate everything, and that should be the next running mate for Victor, Victor Wembanyama. And do you see that in the future for this upcoming offseason? Is that via the draft, trade, free agency? Who's that guy to help Wemby? Yeah, that's a tough one. You know, there's a lot of names out there that I love for the Spurs, but they're names that I'm not sure will be available, right? Like Darius Garland, he would be awesome. Maybe you could go get him. But then again, like if the Cavs are on a, a good playoff run and – they make it work between him and Donovan Mitchell, what are the chances that they're even going to pick up the phone, right? Uh, you look in the draft. It, I don't personally think it's that great of a draft. I think there's some solid role players, but I don't know that there's a lot of guys who you can say, hey, like th this is a future star. Like one guy I like a lot is Rob Dillingham, but Rob Dillingham's also a guy who you look at guys who are typically that size, typically that weight. They're usually career backups. And like he has more upside, I think, than most guys his size. He's got the handle. He's got the shooting off the dribble. He can certainly play make and use his gravity as a score to get other guys open. But like, is he, is he just going to be like a bones Highland if he never gets better at defense and he's at the end of the bench? Like that's a scary proposition. Like you can't take a guy like that top three in the draft and not have absolute certainty as a front office that like, that's your guy. The only other name, and this is probably getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but the only other name who I really think might be a semi-realistic target is a guy like Trey young. Like mm. if the Hawks decide, Hey, we're done with this. Like we need to rebuild. They really can't rebuild unless they trade with San Antonio. Like if you move Trey young anywhere else and you bought him out, guess who owns your picks? The San Antonio Spurs. Like you're not going to be getting that talent. If you bought him out, the Spurs are. So if you want your picks back and you want to rebuild, you basically have to trade San Antonio. They own, you know, basically three of your first rounders unprotected. They own another one. That's a swap between yours and theirs. So if you're bad, they're going to get your pick. Right? So I think he's a guy that if the Hawks are really, really convinced that, hey, we're done with this. Like, we're done with the Trey arrow. We need to start over. That's a guy I think that would be a fantastic fit next to Wimbenyama, a guy who we know is, you know, prime time. He's a guy who can score at all three levels. He's one of the best passers in the NBA. Are there defensive concerns? Yeah, of course. Of course there are. But what is the point of having a generational rim protector, a guy who can clean up for other guys' mistakes and also play on the perimeter a bit if you can't add pieces that maybe aren't going to be the best on the defensive end, like th there's always going to be a trade off. And I think for that reason, Trey makes a lot of sense, but it's up to the Spurs front office. It's up to the Hawks too. Like, do they want to be the team that also not only traded for DeJounte and gave them all those picks, but then is the team that got them Wimbenyama and then now has given them Trey. Like that's a bad look for the Hawks too. So a lot of different moving pieces there. But yeah, like those are the names that I think would be really interesting for the Spurs. Are there any names that you have in mind that you've thought of? Because those are the guys off the top of my head. I think just the Trey Young thing is so interesting to me. I'm glad that you brought that up because I just don't know how, like how realistic on a scale. Let, let me throw it back to you. How On a scale of one to 10, how realistic do you think that trade is going down? Because I hear those, I hear the pontification of saying, oh, Trey on the Spurs makes so much sense. And yeah, in theory, it does. I mean, you add a guy who can score, who will stretch, who, who will space the four for Wemby, especially for him to tack off the dribble, you know, and do anything that he wants to do within the, within the paint. Um, You talk about somebody that can get him the ball at all of his spots. Trey can definitely do that. You know, he's one of the better passers. But I'm just like, why would the, like outside of the reason that you just gave, for the Hawks saying, hey, let's get, I'll give you all your picks back so that way you can control what you got. Cause we don't want to, I mean, that's another question. Would you want DeJounte Murray back? But as you shake your head, no. So I won't, <laughs> I won't go too far there. Yeah. Anyway, but like for Trey, I'm just like, 
I get it, but I just don't know how real that is. And just like exactly the hogs actually doing that because, you know, that's their guy to sell tickets too. So it's like, it's kind of hard to, if you're a, if like you're a Hawks fan and I'm sure there's not many out there, but it's like, it's gotta be <laughs> tough for them to like say, Hey, we're going to give up our guy to now rebuild after, you know, tiny success. They went to the Eastern conference finals, right? We saw them play against the Milwaukee bucks the same year. The bucks won the championship. And then they've just been, you know, on the decline ever since. So yeah, it, it makes sense as an outsider why you would do that because they haven't seen any success. But if you're asking me on a scale of one to 10, if that even happens, like, I don't know, I, I'm going to like probably lean a four just because I don't think that's a, a very realistic. Where would you go, though? I think that's a perfect number because it's one of those things that I think it makes sense on paper, right? It makes total sense on paper for the Spurs and like it makes sense for the Hawks in a certain way, like to rebuild. But Again, I think it's a bad look if you're Landry Fields, you're their general manager who used to work for the Spurs. I'm not saying there's any like collusion there. I'm just saying as the former Spurs employee, you're now working with the Hawks. You have all this experience around RC Buford and guys like Brian Ryan and Popovich, and you come in and you decimate the team like with a bad trade for DeJounte and then a, a trade that allows the Spurs to get Wimbenyama. And then you're also going to give them Trey Young. Like, of course, you're going to get your picks back. You'll probably get other players to match salary, but it looks bad. Like, the optics on that are really bad for you. So I think you're almost resigned to the fact that, well, we'll just write it out with Trey. Like, we'll write it out with Trey, and we'll see what we can do in the future. But, yeah, I think four, like, that feels like a realistic number. Like, anything higher than that, I, I just, I don't know. There's a lot of trade-offs on both sides, but... Certainly for the Hawks, it's a tough decision. It's not just like an obvious, you know, snap your fingers, do it now. So I think four is a perfect number. Salute to Knicks Nation. Thank you all for tuning in for another Game of the Week preview. With me on the other side is my guy, Noah Margaro. George uh, Margaro. I'm sorry. I'm like, I got marbles in my mouth tonight, man. It's been a long day to talk. <laughs> Noah Margaro George. I got to pronounce it right. He is the founder of the Vic and Roll uh, newsletter. You can go subscribe to that over on Substack. And salute to Knicks Nation for all for tuning in right now. And salute to all the franchise channel members. I always got to start off now saying salute to TM. Salute to my guy, Chief <laughs> Mod and Operations. Salute to you for always being here, my guy. Salute to JJ for always tapping in. So, uh, salute to Two Lifted. Thank you for being here. Salute to Mike Rambo as well. And uh, Mike Rambo actually has a question for you. No, he says, are the Spurs still playing hard or are they just like, are they like, you know, bagging, uh, yeah. bagging it all up? Yeah, they're playing hard. And we talked about this a little bit before we went live. But, you know, a lot of teams at this point in the season, they just completely phone it in. But this Spurs team, and I think especially because Wimbenyama went out publicly and said, look, my goal for the rest of the season is to win at least, if not more games than you did a year ago. They're at 17 wins every single night. They're trying to get to that 20. They're trying to get to the 20 wins. They're trying to avoid the worst record in franchise history. And they're playing hard. They beat the Suns minus Wimbenyama. They're just coming off of a win against the Utah Jazz in which Wimbenyama saw a ton of minutes. Vassell saw a ton of minutes. And this is on the second night of a back-to-back. -back. Like They are really gunning for those wins. So, no, they have not phoned it in. And any guys who are not giving effort, Popovich is putting you at the end of the bench right now. He's, he's not playing around. I know they're a bad team, but they're still trying to hold him accountable for sure. Shout out to Travis Ware. Shout out to uh, Do Things in the chat. Shout out to Coach Rubens as well. You talked about Greg Popovich. And before we get into the X's and O's of this game, I got to ask you something. Greg Popovich, this past summer, you know, got a five-year contract extension. Were you shocked to see that happen? Were you shocked to see for five years? Were you shocked to see that he's going to be the guy leading? Actually, I'm, I'm kind of not shocked that he's the guy leading the Wemby experiment just because why else go through what you did last season? Yeah. But for five years, it was like, wow, you – Bob is going to do another five years where there's a, a lot of question on whether or not he would even return to be a coach for the Spurs. Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. First, yeah, I, I think he's the perfect guy to lead it. And so I agree with you on that point. The five years thing, too, was really the thing that surprised me, though, because you look at it, Greg Popovich became the oldest coach in NBA history three years ago. And so not only has he been the oldest coach for three years, but he's going to be here another five and that's going to put him like pretty close to being 80 by the time mm. he's done. So he's 75 now at the end of the extension, he'll be close to 80. I just, it's, it's hard when I, when I first saw that, I was like, wow, that's, that's a really long time, but, and, and not to get too personal here, he, you know, he lost his wife a few years ago. 
and I think that really changed things for him. I think a lot of people, when you think of retirement, you think of, you know, riding off into the sunset with your significant other, you know, just being happy. But, you know, he, do he doesn't have his wife there anymore. So much of his life has been dedicated to basketball. These young guys have given him another opportunity to sort of not just go through the motions and, you know, coach great guys like Duncan and, and Manu and Bruce Bowen and Tony Parker, the guys who don't really need that hard coaching and need to learn the fundamentals. He's getting a chance to do everything that I think coaches love to do with the youngest roster in the NBA. So from, you know, from that perspective, yeah, I, I think it wasn't surprising in that way, but certainly because of the age thing. Yeah. I, I was a little surprised that it was as long as it was. Yeah. I mean, I saw five years like, Holy cow, this man's gonna be coaching team America and he's going to for the, for the Olympics. And now you got another five years with the Spurs, but as you pointed out, you know, unfortunately he lost, uh, he unfortunately lost his wife. And so I could see one just like finding more, finding purpose and doing that. Right. And talking about what you said, like actually getting into the nitty gritty of coaching, right? Like Timmy, Tony, Manu, like those guys were all professionals and they could deal with, you know, the mental fortitude that is Greg Popovich. And that's why they were so successful. I mean, that's why they want so many chips, but I think this, as you said, for, for pop, Totally agree with you where this is like a fresh start for him and giving him life, man. Uh, and that's nice. That's nice to see, man, even after what was a, a tragedy for him. So with Pop being there for another five years, again, Victor Wimbanyama, like, do you see him finishing all five years? Because, you know, he got five years, but it doesn't mean he has to finish all five. Yeah, I think it just all depends on how this next year or so goes, because if they, you know, run it back next year with a similar roster, maybe they add a draft pick in a weaker class and they don't really get much progress going. You know, maybe they're like a 25 win team. They didn't add a lot of free agents. Maybe he's like, OK, I was here to oversee the beginning of the Wimbenyama era. Wimbenyama knows the tone that's been set. Maybe he's still in the front office and he goes, yeah, I'm just done being on the sidelines. I can't do this anymore. But if they really figure out a way to reload this offseason, add some good vets and free agency, find a draft pick who can be impactful or use those picks to add a star, use their other assets to add a star, accelerate the process. I have a hard time seeing him walk away from something that he started and is now seeing success. in. so if they find some success, even if it's just, you know, getting in that play in range and really competing for the plan and maybe even a lower seed in the playoffs. And yeah, like I could see him easily staying around for the five years. But again, it just all depends on, honestly, I think this summer. And, and again, that's no sources or anything, but that's just kind of my feeling of of the situation. It just makes sense to stay if you're seeing success. Whereas if things aren't going well, you know, that that's tough. That's It's, it's hard to, you know, want to stay around the whole five years. But again, he's a guy who's stuck around for every commitment. He's had that opt-out clause in all of his previous extensions where if it's not going well, he wants out at the end of the summer, he can. He's never left in any of the previous ones. So maybe he does stay around for the five years. Okay. Let's see, man. I'm 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 very interested to see if he will be around uh for all those five years, man. Because 80 years old, be coaching at 80 years old, that is that is something. But hey, man, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens with Greg Popovich. But let, yo, let me give us let me give a shout out to our sponsor, which is underdog fantasy. And for everyone out there, if you haven't used the app at all. Uh, make sure to go to either the web browser or you can download the app Underdog Fantasy, whatever fits your fancy, and use that promo code KFTV to get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. Look, what I like using this app when it comes to watching any, any NBA game, I like to put a little money down on the line, see if I can win something in return, you know, and whether it's, you know, choosing guys for doing for drafts or doing pickums. It doesn't matter. As as we've been doing on uh, for post game, you hear CP talk about we're doing drafts. Last night you saw CP, you know, gloating that he was going to win, but then JD comes from a sixty point deficit to take first place. CP gets second, and unfortunately, I get third. But don't worry, guys, I, I've won the three out of the last five matchups, so I'm still good at riding high. But look, you can either do drafts, which you know are positionless so you can choose up to six players and compete with any of your friends you could do up to like i think eight people i think you do up to eight people in these drafts maybe even more and then when it comes to the pickums you can make any selections from two to five players as long as those two players if you do minimum two they gotta be two players from two different teams and look you can put any money down you can go the insured route you know if you don't think all of them are gonna hit and you think four out of five are gonna hit you can go that route 
And the cool thing, too, is that you can mix and match all sports. Right now, we have hockey. We have basketball. Today's opening day for baseball. So, no, you know what you can do? You can mix and match all the players from every different sport. That way, you can say, you know what? I think, you know, Volpe's going to be hitting uh, some singles today, man. I think he's going to be getting on base. You know, I think, you know, right now you got Jalen Brown playing against the Atlanta Hawks. You say, hey, maybe he can get over 21 and a half points, and you, you're, you're confident there. So, you can mix and match all sports, put money down. And it's so much fun. And this is where I went tonight. All right. So, Dan, if you could pull it up. I just threw it in the Slack. Uh, just threw it in the Game of the Week preview Slack. You, tonight, I chose, the game as the games were still going on, because sometimes I like to do, is as the game's going on, get a feel for how the game's playing out. So that way I know if I'm going to get some money back. So I chose Jalen Brown, higher than 21 and a half points, rebounds, and assists. He's not too far off from hitting that right now. Uh, I then also chose DeJounte Murray for... Higher than 30 and a half points. Sorry, no, I had to go with uh, your, your former guy, <laughs> DeJounte, over there. But he's closing in on 30 points, so I think I'm I'm close on hitting that as well. And I chose Jason Tatum for higher than 23 and a half points. So that's where I went tonight, and I chose three, man. I want to keep it safe tonight, and I put the insured route because, you know, I want to get back into the pickums, and I'm trying to, you know, be a little careful with how I'm spending <laughs> my funds. I want, to, I want to make sure I'm winning some money. So that's where I went tonight. I'll let you know how I do after everything's done, but – Make sure to download the app Underdog Fantasy or go to the web browser. Use that promo code KFTV to get up to a $100 match. All right. No, I just had to, you know, go and talk about our sponsor of the show <laughs> for a little bit. But let's get back into now the, you know, the, 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 the details of this game. So let's start off with some of the uh, statistics that I've found, especially for the San Antonio Spurs. You know, the Spurs, as being a, a, a young team, inexperienced team, there's not a lot of things they're going to be great in. But if there's anything that they are good at, it's fast break points and it is scoring uh, points in the paint. And for me, I think that's two areas where I'm looking at, especially when going against the New York Knicks, because sometimes you can catch the Knicks sleep, but when it comes to uh, fast break points they are 13th or middle of the pack so if they're not ready especially with all these especially with the injuries they've had to deal with you know a young team like the Spurs who likes to get out and run and get some easy points that could be a way that they could attack the Knicks and then when I'm thinking about points in the paint uh, it's going to be tough for them because that's one of the New York Knicks strong suits there's six when it comes to preventing opponents from scoring in the paint so for a young team with Wimbanyama I think that may be where I see the matchup taking a turn where as in if the Spurs can do that, then they may have a chance to beat the Knicks. But if the Knicks are able to hold them and put them in check, I don't see it. A, I don't see it as a good outcome for the Spurs. What do you think about those two stats right there? Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, if, if the Spurs aren't able to score inside the paint, which is honestly where a lot of their points come from because they're not a very good three point shooting team and they don't have a lot of guys who can get their spots in the mid range outside of Devin Vassell then you may have a wrap on the Spurs. I think we kind of saw it in that first matchup. Bigs who can be physical with Wimbenyama, but they're still mobile enough to kind of move their feet and push him off of his spot early so that he's not getting good post positioning. He has a tough time. So if they can have that sort of matchup with, whether it's Isaiah Hardenstein, whether it's Mitchell Robinson, just make him uncomfortable, make him feel you early in possessions. The Spurs don't have a lot else to do, right? They don't have a lot else that they can turn to. They have... Uh, you know, the Devin Vassell, who I think has been fantastic throughout the season. But if you kind of prevent them from getting in those two man actions where it's coming out of an empty side, whether it's a DHO, whether it's some zoom action, if you can prevent them from getting to those spots, whether you can prevent Wimbenyama from getting to his spots early on post ups, I think you can have a real wrap on the Spurs because, again, even if you're doubling Wimbenyama, even if you're sending help in the post, it, it shouldn't matter all that much. Like, they're they're just not a great three point shooting team. So yeah, if if they can win that battle and in, inside the paint, I think that that the you know the Knicks are probably in a pretty good spot at the end of the game. I I think so as well. And I think when you talk about three point shooting, right? Um, the Knicks they haven't been great as if they were at the beginning of the season. Um, they were hot last night though when it came to shooting the three against uh the Toronto Raptors. But also the Raptors didn't have their guys at Scotty Barnes, Emmanuel Quickly, and R.J. Barrett. But nonetheless, they were able to go out there and just shoot the fair one with uh, against the Toronto Raptors. And I think they could continue that type, same type of success against the Spurs. Now, what would you say about if the Knicks are hot from three? What is this, is that? Would that be a detriment to the Spurs staying in this match? One, I get that they're not going to be able to keep up shooting wise, but defensively, 
how how would they how would that pan out for the Spurs? Yeah, I mean, if the if the Knicks are hot from three, the Spurs are a team that, I mean, we've seen it throughout the season. They've gotten a little bit better at it, but they're a little jumpy. Um, so if they perceive you as a threat from three, they will leave their feet on a pump fake. That you know, obviously, if that's happening, a guy can either a shoot it or he can move the ball. He can drive the ball, but regardless of what happens in that situation, you're sitting the Spurs in rotation. They're a young team. Their communication isn't all that great on rotations. And if you can get them moving, if you can collapse the defense, then yeah, like you can do a lot of damage on the Spurs team. But uh, if they're not shooting well from three and you're having to take it inside again and again and again, they've got Wimbenyama inside the paint. You know, he's not, he's no longer playing like the first time you saw them uh, playing power forward. He's not really on the perimeter like we saw with jaron jackson jr where he's more of a help side defender rather than a rim protector who's mm. kind of patrolling the paint that's what Wimbenyama has become now he is a guy who is not necessarily just sitting in the paint but he's going to be there inside the you know patrolling that restricted area so if you're able to shoot well i think that can definitely mitigate a lot of your concerns about well now we have to take the ball into Wimbenyama, the most prolific shot blocker in the league right now and, and now with you talking about Wemby just being camped in, not necessarily camped in the paint, but manning the paint. Let me talk about my key matchup for tonight for for this for this game, and that is none other than Victor Wembanyama and Isaiah Harnstein duking it out. And look, I, we know what Wemby is, rookie of the year type candidate. I mean, you got the numbers right there through the last ten games. He's averaging twenty one points, averaging eleven rebounds. Uh, he's getting you about. He's four and a half assists, close to five, shooting forty six percent from the field. You know, getting four blocks per game which is just <laughs> insane shooting 71 percent from the free throw line and then for i heart averaging 10 points getting you about nine rebounds per game getting you three assists per game uh shooting 78 percent from the field getting you close to two blocks and shooting uh what was it what is that we got 79 percent from the free throw line I i'm looking at this matchup man because i heart you know he's not he's not like Mitch when it comes to being as mobile as like guarding pick and rolls being on the perimeter, but he hustles well enough where you still have to honor his defense and he can cause problems, man. I mean, there's games where he'll get some four blocks. There's games where he'll get you like 15 boards and he's going to battle. He's not going to be afraid of anybody, whether it's like Anthony Davis, Carl Anthony Towns, Rudy Gobert. He's going to go out there and go compete with any big that he's matched up with. And I see him doing the same thing against Victor Wembanyama. And I, I'm looking at I heart to be physical, as you talked about, which you know yeah. can be can be the you know the equalizing factor to Wembenyama. I see that playing to Isaiah Hartenstein uh, in this matchup. Um, yeah, I get it. Wemby can shoot the three. He can initiate the offense. He can do those things, and that may throw Hartenstein a little off balance because it's not many centers can do all those things. Yeah, but I, for me, I'm going to be leaning towards Isaiah Hartenstein in this matchup. What do you think about this key matchup of the game? Yeah, I definitely think it is a key matchup for the San Antonio Spurs and New York Knicks here because, again, if you're able to be really physical with Wimbenyama, and and I think it goes beyond like on the defensive end. I think one thing we've seen with when they played the Houston Rockets with Alper and Shingun, and even when they played the Denver Nuggets with Nikola Jokic, these guys, even though they kind of knew, okay, Wimbenyama's probably going to block me a few times, but go at him. Like, go at him lower your shoulder into him, make him feel you on the defensive end where he's having to guard you and he's taking that punishment because the more he feels you, the more uncomfortable he's going to be. So if Isaiah Hardenstein can do that on both sides of the ball where he's doing his work early on defense, where he's making him feel him on post-ups if they give him those opportunities, yeah, I think that that can be really huge towards kind of taking Wimbenyama out of his comfort zone and making this I wouldn't say a fair fight because the Knicks are just a better team. It's probably not a fair fight to begin with, but <laughs> definitely putting more, you know, momentum behind their attack, giving them an even better chance to win this game. Cause if I'm being hundred percent honest, it feels like a matchup where the Knicks probably have this one, as long as they pay respect to the opponent, right? You don't want to come into this game and just, Oh, it's a win. It's the Spurs. Like if you do that, Spurs could sneak up on you, but, Again, like this is a big matchup for for the Knicks, and it's one that they probably can take advantage to a certain extent. For sure, for sure. But then looking at the rest of the matchup between all the stars, you know, we already know the center position is going to be guys duking it out. I'm expecting another small ball lineup from Tom Thibodeau. He's been inserting Deuce McBride into that starting rotation. So, you know, it would be a 
Jalen Brunson, Deuce McBride, Dante DiVincenzo, Josh Hart, and then Isaiah Hartenstein. And I would expect uh, McBride to get the Devin Vassell uh, assignment. I expect Brunson to be on Trey Jones. I'm looking at Josh Hart on Jeremy Sohan just to compete for rebounding. And then Dante will be on uh, Julian as well. So that's my matchups. What do you think? Are, do, you, do you agree with those matchups? I think that's probably going to be how it goes. I, th- I just think it makes sense. Like if Jalen Brunson is probably not your best defender, makes sense. Smaller guy, Trey Jones. And yeah, Jeremy Sohan is a guy I think that easily kind of gets discounted sometimes, but he slips through the cracks. He's a great rebounder. He's a guy who's going to get those extra chance points. He's going to get those extra possessions, hustling on the ground, fighting on the boards. Like if you have a guy who can match that intensity, and I'm very sure that Josh Hart can, that's the matchup. And other than that, like it just... Everyone else sort of falls into place perfectly there. It just makes sense with the matchups that you listed out. Do you think do you think the Spurs will go in a different direction with trying to put someone with wingspan on Brunson? Like, is Vassell that defensive guy that you're gonna trust out there? Or is it Sohan? Like how how do you think they'll do it defensively? Yeah, I think they'll probably let Trey Jones take the assignment at the beginning of the night mm-hmm. if things start going south, because occasionally they do. Like Trey Jones is a is a solid point of attack defender in the pick and roll, but If you can get him more one-on-one, that's where things sort of start to break down. He's not super big. He doesn't have the biggest wingspan. Um, You know, you can drive through him if you're a bigger, more physical guard. And like Brunson's got all the stops, right? He's got all the tricks. So if it's not going well, I could easily see them moving Jeremy Sohan onto a guy like Jalen Brunson. And just as a random little statistic fact here, you know, Jeremy Sohan has been kind of their guy who, when there's an all-star to be defended, He's the guy who's getting the, the the assignment. He's guarded all stars from the 2023 and 2024 All Star games for 1,703 possessions this season. So roughly 40 percent of all of his defensive possessions have been on All Stars. So if it's not going well with Trey, they'll probably move Jeremy Sohan over on to him. I don't think that's a great matchup either because that's been typically the things he struggled with is smaller guards who are shifty. But it's worth a ch- it's you know it's worth a chance, worth a try if it's not going well with Trey. For sure, for sure. And, you know, I guess getting back to, like, the center matchup, because you did bring up Mitchell Robinson earlier in the show. You know, he did play his first game, as I noted, last night against the Toronto Raptors. And he played, I'm pretty sure it was a total of seven minutes. Let me just double-check that. He played a total of 12 minutes. Never mind. Oh, seven minutes in the first half. He played 12 in total throughout the game. So I see the same thing happening tomorrow for... (laughs) Mitch just to like get his uh to get his legs back under him, but I would expect him to get that Wemby matchup as well. And whenever iHeart is out there, and I, I just I'm not I'm confident that Mitch will be fine defending wise, but I'll expect like some mistakes here and there just as he's trying to get get his legs back under him. So I, I'm not expecting that same dominant performance that he did at the beginning of the season, but I would be impressed as we have Mitchell Robinson on the screen right here. Uh, <laughs> as uh, his, the correctional officer that he is, the warden. <laughs> so, with that, I'm going to go with to my X factor now because I in this game to me, Noah is just all about the centers and all about the bigs. And so, outside of Mitchell Robinson, Isaiah Hartenstein, my X factor is Precious Achua because I think okay. he's going to be another guy that is going to be. Heavily involved when it comes to guarding Victor Wembanyama in this matchup. He's been playing some of the backup five minutes as well. I know he's going to be out there with Mitchell Robinson as Mitchell Robinson too, but Precious, he's been holding it down, whether it's playing the four, playing backup five, and he's really come into his own since joining the New York Knicks. It took a few games, man. Even I was questioning his (laughs) game, but he has now shut me up and shown that he is a baller and he's representing New York to the best of his ability, being a kid from the Bronx, um, raised in the Bronx, I'll say, raised in the Bronx, and, and just put and put it all out there on the floor. So Precious Achua is my X factor for tomorrow's matchup. Who's your X factor for the game? Yeah, I think it would be a cop out if I said Wimbenyama because obviously, like he's you know they they live and die <laughs> by him. But I think I think if I had to pick a player, it's probably Devin Vassell. Like if Devin Vassell is not able to score, most of the time the Spurs lose. Like you have two real reliable sources of offense. You've got Wimbenyama. You've got Devin Vassell. If Vassell is not able to score and Deuce McBride is able to hold him in check and make him uncomfortable in some ways, then yeah, like that could swing things. Now if Devin Vassell is playing like he has the last couple of games where he had 26 against the Phoenix Suns 
completely healthy Phoenix Suns with no Wimbenyama helped them get the dub. 31 last night against the Utah Jazz on great shooting. He's hot like that, then yeah, I mean, the Spurs sort of live and die by him because when he's scoring, he's able to make things easier for everyone else. Suddenly, extra eyes have to be on Devin Vassell. Where's Devin Vassell at? What do we need to do about Devin Vassell? But if he's, you know, cold, who cares? Let's just go swarm Wimbenyama. Let's swarm mm. Wimbenyama and we'll live with Jeremy Sohan and, you know, Trey Jones and Julian Champagne taking threes. Like, we're fine with that. Let's let him drive. Who cares? So, yeah, Vassell, he's got to be the X factor for me because if he's scoring, the Spurs definitely have a chance to upset the Knicks here. Okay, there you go. So for the Spurs, Noah says it's Devin Vassell. For me, for the Knicks, Precious Achua when it comes to guarding Victor Wembanyama in this matchup. All right, Noah. Well, to wrap this up, you know, I could ask you who I think you you believe is going to win. I know you're gonna probably choose the Spurs. I'm gonna choose the Knicks. So how let's make it let's make this a little bit more interesting. How close will this game be to for tomorrow's matchup? I think it's gonna be a fairly close game. Uh and, and it's this is nothing against Isaiah Hardenstein. We talked about how he can be physical with Wimbenyama and make him a little bit uncomfortable, but I think Wimbenyama is one of those guys who he's not probably just going to be sitting in the pain and he's going to be a guy who takes the ball up sometimes runs some pick and rolls as the ball handler he's also going to be someone who you can iso a bit on the perimeter against someone who's not as mobile like an isaiah hardenstein like if he's able to get into a good rhythm if the cell is playing well if other guys are just playing to a baseline where they're respectable out there you get some production from you know zach collins kelvin johnson off the bench like they have been recently then yeah, like I think this can be a really, really close game because to be honest with you, a lot of teams I still think are coming into this matchup and they see, oh, you know, 16 wins, 17 wins. You know, this is a gimme. And it's not. It's it's just simply not a gimme. So if the Knicks don't come out there, they don't respect their opponent, they think it's a, just a rollover matchup, it could be a very close game. And unfortunately, I think that's how a lot of teams are approaching the Spurs right now. So I do think it's going to be a close game. I don't think the Knicks are going to do that tomorrow. This is like a one team that like, They've been kind of on their business, and I still think that the I'm not saying the Knicks are going to go, you know, just demolish the Spurs tomorrow. I think they're I think the Knicks are due because they've been doing that to the Pistons. They did that to the Raptors. Um, I do think that this will be not necessarily a super close game. I'm not saying it's by five points, but I think the Knicks will have like a solid ten points on the Spurs. I think I think just for. One, you got Jalen Brunson. I, I I don't know who's going to stop him on the Spurs, and he's going to get to his spots. The one thing that I'll say for me that will teeter this game is whether Dante or McBride are coming out in their offensive bag. Now, McBride has been doing the damn thing the last three games against the Nets, yeah. against the Pistons, against the Raptors. He's been going out there, knocking down threes, and, and scoring very well. Um, Dante has been very efficient with the threes. He's been in a little bit of slump prior, but – if these two guys are going to show up for tomorrow, then I could then I think it can get out of hand for the Spurs. But if these guys are, are struggling a little bit from on the offensive side of the ball, I could see it being a close one. And then we will need a you know a nice master performance from Jalen Brunson. That's how I think this game is going to go. Um, but with that being said, Noah, I appreciate you coming on the show as always and helping me preview this game. Please let the listeners know where they can find you if you got any upcoming work we should be on the lookout for. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. First off, thank you so much for bringing me on. I always love talking hoops with you. Uh, but yeah, you can find me on Twitter at N underscore Magaro, M-A-G-A-R-O. You can also find my Spurs words on Substack over at the Vic and Roll. Uh, exactly what it sounds like, Vic and Roll. And then you can also check out some of the film study stuff I'm doing over on YouTube. It is just Noah Magaro George. It's just my name. So if you know my name, you can find me on YouTube, but that's where you'll find my stuff for now. Have some stuff in the work for all of those platforms. But yeah, thank you again for having me. I'm looking forward to this matchup, looking forward to this game, and just appreciate you bringing me on to talk some hoops. Absolutely, no. You, you know I always got to bring you on to talk some hoops, man. I always love talking basketball with you. And make sure to follow Noah, all right? We got the handle right here, right down below our screens, all right? Just you see it right here. You see mine right here. You see Alex Chateris. You see Noah's on the other side. So make sure to follow the handles. It's right there. It's so easy to do. Support his work, man. If you love basketball, he's a great follow on Twitter. He does a lot of thorough, in-depth research. So make sure to give him that follow and support what he does. 
does. And thank you all again, Knicks Nation, for tuning in. Even Spurs Nation. There, we have some Spurs fans <laughs> that tune into the show. So salute to all you as well for tuning in. Or if you're just a, a Hoops fan in general, thank you all for tuning in once again. Salute to all the franchise channel members for all that they do and helping support the channel. And salute to all the regulars. I see jo- John Talento in here. Shout out to Two Lifted again. TM, I got to shout out to TM as always. Uh, shout out to JJ too. We got Eric Garcia in here as well. We got John. We got John Petit. We got KG74. What up, my guy? What up, my guy? We got all the regulars in here tapping in to make sure they catch and get catch up and get ready for tomorrow's game. So salute to all you. And make sure to remember, support our sponsor, Underdog Fantasy. Use that promo code KFTV to get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. Make sure to support NextFanTV.com as well. Support all the great writers over there, too. And make sure to hit that thumbs up button for your boys. And make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. All right, everybody, we'll catch you later and we'll chat, we'll chat, we'll, we'll tap in tomorrow after the game. But remember, remember, everybody, CP has got Scott Perry, former GM of the New York Knicks, coming on tomorrow. So make sure to tap into that show as well and make sure to tap into post game afterwards for the 500th episode of KFTV post game. So, salute to Knicks Nation once again. We'll catch you later. We out. <laughs>